welcome back. Let's continue talking about social psychological research. And now let's talk about how we refine our ideas. This section primarily is talking about how we define and measure different variables. It sounds like it's dry, but it's really very interesting. Let's first begin by talking about how we go from abstract ideas to very specific measurements. Think about it. In psychology, we're often interested in measuring and studying these very abstract conceptual variables, something like depression. We hear about depression so much, we think about things like depression so much that it seems like it really is a thing, but it's not. It's, it's a collection of many different things. It's not something that's easy to measure. It's abstract. Same thing as self-esteem. Self-esteem is very complicated, very complex. It's not one thing. We can't just take a measurement of self-esteem and think that everybody's going to agree. Well, for purposes of research though, remember scientific research is all about systematic observation and measurement. We need to be very precise about what it is we're going to measure. Well, that's what an operational definition is all about. That's when we're going to state very specifically how we are gonna measure one of these conceptual variables, something like depression or self-esteem. How specifically am I going to measure it for purposes of my research study? So for example, if I was interested in depression, I might say, well, for purposes of this study, we're gonna do a clinical interview with licensed psychologists. And in order for somebody to be diagnosed as being depressed, they're going to have to meet the criteria according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM. So there we would have very specific criteria for how we're defining something very abstract like depression. Or think about something like uh, self-esteem. Uh, there are lots of different scales that have been published uh, by psychologists in research journals that uh, have very good psychometric properties. The bottom line is they do a good job of measuring this very abstract thing like self-esteem. The Rosenberg self-esteem scale is pretty well known and this is where we use several items on the scale to ask a variety of questions that tap into self-esteem. You can see a few right there. Now, of course, whenever we're measuring something complex and abstract like depression or self-esteem, you know, not everybody's going to agree. And we want to make sure that we're measuring what we really want to measure, what we're really intending to measure. And that's what construct validity is all about. So these are things that researchers worry about. We don't need to worry about it all that much for purposes of an introductory social psychology class. But I just want to make sure you understand this is some serious business. We're measuring some things that are tough to measure. Let's talk a little bit about how specifically we will measure a few different things. Because of course we can use different techniques. One technique is very straightforward and that involves using what we call self-report scales. And in self-report, as you would assume based on the name, the participants of the research study are disclosing to us you know, their thoughts, their feelings, their behaviors. Remember we talked about the ABCs in psychology. A stands for affect, so we're talking about feelings. B stands for behaviors. C, cognition, so we're talking about thoughts in general. So in this case, we're just asking people how they think, how they feel, what they do, and we're letting them report. So a social psychologist might be interested in interracial dating and might just come out and ask, would you date someone from another race, yes or no? Very straightforward, very easy. Now, of course, we can build upon that. If I were to ask just one question about interracial dating, I can only get so far. Uh, it's not a, a refined enough measure, so I might ask several questions. And I'm just bringing you back to that Rosenberg self-esteem scale. You can see that there are several questions designed to tap into that one concept of self-esteem. So this is another self-report measure. We would just call that a measurement scale, and this is just one item, one question. But they're still self-report. Self-report is very quick, very easy, very cheap. But you know when things are quick, easy, and cheap, there are usually problems associated with them. And self-report definitely has some problems. I mean, we rely on it a lot, don't get me wrong, but there are some problems associated with it and we have to deal with that. So one problem, for example, has to do with the participant's memory. Sometimes they just don't really remember the answers to the questions that we're asking. And sometimes they're motivated to distort their memories to make themselves look a little better. I mean, sometimes we're trying to see if there's relationships between 
people's intelligence and a variety of other things. And one way we might measure intelligence is based on grades. So just assume for a minute that you're in a research study and I'm asking you about grades from elementary school and you're thinking back to your report card. You might not be able to remember very well specifically the grades that you got. And you might even remember back in elementary school, some of the grades were not even A, B, C types of grades. You might have had like an S for satisfactory. I remember O's for outstanding. I have no idea how I scored back in those days. But you see, I am somewhat motivated to put on those rose-colored glasses and think like, well, I did pretty well. I, I probably got an A in that math class. I, I really have no idea. And if you as a researcher are going to ask me questions about my grades, well, I'm going to give you a bunch of garbage because I'm just going to essentially be guessing. That's a problem. Let's talk about a few other problems. Demand, social desirability, framing. Let's take them one at a time. Let's first talk about what we call demand characteristics. Here's the bottom line. Think about that Rosenberg self-esteem scale again. As you look through those items, you'll see not one item asked specifically about self-esteem. But by looking at them, you can pretty quickly tell that the researcher is trying to measure self-esteem. Now, as a research subject, you might think to yourself, oh, I know what's going on. I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to measure my self-esteem. They probably want me to answer like this. We've already lost that subject at that point. We don't want somebody overthinking things. And if they're starting to respond in a way that they think they want us to respond, then uh, that's a problem. And it's essentially like the researcher has created a condition where they are demanding that the subject respond in a particular way. So that's what we call demand characteristics. Let's talk about another problem that I have in that list, social desirability. Let's say I ask you if you are planning to vote in an upcoming election. Voting is something that we hold dear in our society. People are not typically proud to say that they just stayed home and they didn't vote. So you might respond in a socially desirable way and say, yeah, of course, I, I plan on voting, but you really don't. Look at this question here as well. I mean, we're talking about something like race. That's, that's a highly charged issue in our society. You might say like, yeah, of course, I would date someone from another race, even though really you would not but you're just responding in a socially desirable kind of way. Let's talk about framing for a second. This is crazy, but it's just the way it is when it comes to doing research. The way I ask you a question can very, in, very much influence how you respond to that question, even though the questions are almost exactly the same. Let's say I'm just asking to what extent you like or approve of Hillary Clinton. Now, I will get some basic approval ratings from that research. But I can make a, a very simple adjustment in the way I describe this woman and find some very different uh, results. So, for example, I might ask some people in this first situation, to what extent do you approve of the job that Hillary Clinton is doing? But I might ask people in another situation, to what extent do you approve of the job of Hillary Rodham Clinton? Just by referring to her using different names. Sometimes she goes by Hillary Clinton, sometimes Hillary Rodham Clinton. It's almost like people see two totally different people. And research has shown that her approval ratings are lower when people are asked about Hillary Rodham Clinton. So you can see that there are really some problems associated with asking basic questions and having people self-report. It doesn't mean that we should stop using self-report measures because they are very quick, easy, cheap. But um, we need to understand some of the problems and try to you know, measure to what extent we have those problems. Now, I keep mentioning uh, that we've got these problems. There's got to be some way to deal with some of these problems. And bogus pipeline is, is one way. I tell you, it's not all that common anymore that people use it, but it's very interesting. Um, bogus pipeline is this whole idea that I have a pipeline into your thoughts, and it's, it really is bogus. But I would put you in a situation where you think it's correct. So just imagine like a polygraph type of situation where you're hooked up. I can, I can measure your breathing, your respiration. I can measure your blood pressure, your heart rate. I can measure how much your, your skin is sweating um, by putting these electrodes on your fingers. I can measure a variety of things. And, you know, people tend to believe that um, others can tell when they're lying if they're taking those types of measurements. And that's a whole other issue that we don't need to get into right now. But if I hook you up and start asking questions, like, would you date someone from another race? And I convince you that I can tell if you're lying, you are more likely than to tell me the truth. So bogus pipeline is one way to deal with uh, the problems that we sometimes have via self-report. 
Now, I keep making the point that uh, self-reports are quick, easy, and cheap. And easy really should be in quotes because uh, there's nothing easy about almost anything when we're conducting research. Think about that one question. Would you date someone from another race? Well, I absolutely would. In fact, I married a woman who is Hispanic. Her dad was Cuban and Puerto Rican. And she sees herself as Hispanic. She is Hispanic. Um, but check this out. This is where things get really interesting. It seems really straightforward, something like race. Well, think about our census because the census is what tracks that type of information. And you'll see that not everybody agrees about how we can classify races um, or even if race and uh, Hispanic classifications belong together. You can see in the census it says, please answer both question eight about Hispanic origin and question nine about race. For this census, Hispanic origins are not races. Well, that's news to a lot of Hispanic people who consider Hispanic to be their race. So my wife, for example, would go through the census and uh, she would say uh, that yes, she is Cuban. That's how she self-identifies. Then she would get to this question about race and she'd say, uh, no, I don't see myself as white. I don't see myself as black. I'm not American. She does not see an option for herself. So what does she and many people in her situation do? She would click right here on some other race. And what would she write in? Hispanic. So this is simply my point. It is very tough sometimes to measure even what you consider simple things. All right, so self-report, very wonderful tool that we have, but there are some problems associated with it. And you should keep that in mind as you're learning about the research throughout this entire semester. All right, let's move along. Let's talk about actually making observations, uh, specifically the researcher making observations, not relying on the research subject to provide a self-report. So researchers' observations, you know, when they're actually seeing things out there and taking measurements, can be very simple. They can be very complex. It's probably relatively obvious to you. J just imagine a researcher uh, studying children and how they get along with others uh, on like a playground. And this particular researcher might just be observing to see if boys are playing with boys, if girls are playing with girls, and to what extent they see mixed groups. It's usually pretty easy to tell who's a boy, who's a girl. That's something that would be relatively simple, usually. But now think about something much more complex. Like imagine that I'm a researcher and I'm studying something like bullying. Now, it might be pretty straightforward. In this situation right here, it looks like this boy is bullying the other boy. Uh, that's probably something that most all of us would agree upon. But look at this situation right here. This kid, it seems like he's being teased. Is this something that we consider bullying? I mean, there's nothing physical going on. Well, we need to understand that when we're observing things out there, they can be very sophisticated things. Bullying doesn't necessarily need to be physical. People can uh, engage in relational types of aggression, you know, like by teasing people, keeping them out of a group, for example. Look at this situation right here. Imagine that you're on the schoolyard, you're doing this research, you're looking for instances of bullying behaviors, and you're observing what's going on. I have no idea what's even going on over here. Is bullying going on? I, I don't know. This kid looks upset. This kid looks like he's kind of squaring off with him. Uh, are they just playing? Are they just discussing? Because, of course, if they're just having an argument, that's not necessarily bullying. See, it's tough. It gets really tough to determine what we're actually observing and how we classify it. Well, obviously, the observers involved in research must be trained. And they must be looking for specific behaviors, specific situations, so that they can categorize those behaviors and situations. And later on, we have to assess as researchers what we call inter-rater reliability. So there are going to be a couple people out there on that schoolyard working for the researcher, looking for bullying behaviors. And later on, we're going to see to what extent we agreed when we were in this situation, did we both rate this as a bullying situation? Or did we both rate this as a non-bullying situation? We need to make sure that that agreement level is relatively high. Because if it's not relatively high, our construct validity is going to be relatively low. What we're trying to measure, we're not really measuring very accurately. So we need that agreement to be high. Now, these direct observations that we're talking about, when the researchers actually make the observations, they really help avoid the memory failures and distortions that we talked about with the research subjects themselves. 
um, because we're not relying on them to give us the information. But when we are making direct observations, we also risk altering the behaviors that we're trying to observe. Uh, think about being out on that schoolyard again. Let me go back a couple pictures. If I'm out there watching these kids and you're out there watching these kids and they see us, they might not engage in these behaviors at all because they realize that someone's watching them and they need to be on their best behavior. Well, that's a problem. That's obviously a problem with the direct observation. We call that, by the way, the Hawthorne effect. That comes from a, a famous study um, done years ago. Uh, it was specifically done in uh, Hawthorne, Illinois at a Western electric plant. And the researchers were trying to manipulate the work environment to get workers to be more productive. And they were interested in a variety of things, like, for example, lighting. They thought, you know, like maybe if we increase the lighting, then the workers would be able to manufacture things better. So they would have test rooms where they would manipulate the environment, like the lighting. And in general, they found that no matter what they did, if they had more lighting, uh, they'd have more productivity. If they gave them more incentives, they'd have more productivity. If they gave them more breaks, they'd have more productivity. Then they even went back to that original issue, they, and they put them in the test room with the original lighting. They had more productivity. They gave them less lighting. They had more productivity. The bottom line was the workers knew that they were being observed. They knew they were being measured, and it changed their typical original behaviors. So you see, research isn't easy. There are all kinds of issues that we need to overcome. Now, of course, there is some high-tech stuff that social psychologists are doing nowadays. So things like brain imaging, um, brain activation, we might be measuring. Uh, things like eye tracking. You know, I can actually look to see what you're interested in by focusing on where your eyes focus. Reaction times. Social cognition uses a lot of reaction time measurements. We will talk, for example, about research on the IAT, the Implicit Association Test which is able to assess if people have some relatively racist attitudes that they might not even know about. And it all has to do with how quickly people respond to their keyboard when they're trying to classify faces as black faces or white faces. And when they see words that are either good words like happy or bad words like maybe death, something like that. Um, and you see when we start to mix things up with white faces and good words and black faces and good words and white faces and bad words and black faces and bad words, it starts to, we start to see differences in how quickly people respond to those faces and those words. And it tells us some really interesting things about the people. We'll learn more about that later. That's some of the high tech stuff that we're going to talk about. So we'll discuss those examples throughout the semester. All right, well, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon.